Um, okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about the vision behind Julia and uh, why we created it. Why, basically, you know, why we didn't just try to extend a different system or modify a different system. Why we felt like we wanted to try to take on a new a new language approach to trying to provide a better environment for doing technical computing. Yeah. So I'm going to start in a slightly odd place, which is I'm going to talk about text processing. Um, and the thing about text processing is that once upon a time, not super long ago, but maybe 20 years ago, this was kind of a niche programming language area. Um, you had these special languages like Snowball and Sed and Awk and you know, Perl started out this way and has sort of morphed into a general purpose language, but it was very much for text processing at first. Um, so you had general purpose languages that were good at doing certain kinds of things. You know, you could write C, you could write an operating system in C, um, but you didn't really want to do a lot of crazy text processing because it's just really painful and awkward. So you had these special purpose languages that tackled the whole uh, you know, processing streams of text. Um, but now that is sort of a crazy idea. Nobody thinks about that anymore. I mean, you sometimes will use said and because it's convenient, but really what's happened is that you have these general purpose languages that have completely subsumed the area of text processing. So, you know, if you're going to be doing general purpose programming or text processing, you can just as well use Python, or you can use Perl 5, or you can use Ruby. So what does this have to do with what we're talking about now? The next slide is sort of, go on. So uh, essentially, I, I sort of suspect that uh, these technical computing languages uh, that exist, and here, here's a bunch of them, are, are, are kind of like that now. So this is a, this is a, a big list of about, uh, about 40 uh, systems that I've found look, looking around. Uh, and the, these are all uh, languages, environments that people have made for doing various kinds of mathematical and scientific computing. And this is, this is kind of amazing if you look at it. There, there are actually more than this. I don't think this is, this is probably not exhaustive. Uh, and that, that, that so many times people have felt that you know, they, they don't have quite the, uh, the, the right tool they need to do uh, the kind of programming they need. And so people make, you know, make their own environment. You know, like there, there's R for statistics. Uh, and different, different languages have different uh, specialties. And why, why do people uh, you know, keep feeling the need uh, to, to make these systems? It's, you know, in, instead of uh, you know, seeing uh, some existing you know, general purpose language as being somehow good enough uh, for, for what they want. And so, so many of these things uh, keep getting created. And, it, and so it, you know, it makes me wonder, you know, what's, what, what is it that everyone is searching for here? Uh, and and you know, would, would it be possible to make uh, another general purpose language that would somehow satisfy all of these people? Uh, so that you could sort of do, do to that, uh, this, this sort of technical computing niche, what has sort of happened to that, the text processing uh, languages niche, where you know, now we just have a, a general language that's sort of good enough uh, for doing that. So uh, yeah, that's, that's the question. I mean, there's certain interesting characteristics about the, the, the technical computing niche. Um, uh, one of them is that you really want a high performance language. Performance is crucial. Um, the other interesting one that's very much at odds with that is that everything on that previous slide was a dynamic language or a dynamic environment for doing technical computing. So you have these, t these tensions where you want to do very exploratory sorts of things. Um, but at the same time, you also really need high performance. And that has traditionally caused a bit of a, a, a rift and a difficulty in, in terms of technical computing. We think that's part of why it's difficult to, to get a general purpose language that's also good enough. Yeah. So, um. yeah, so that, that's what I talked about a little bit up there at the top. Uh, you want to talk about this standard compromise? Sure, sure. So what's uh, so in in all of those uh, well most of those forty systems the the pattern that you sort of see is that people you know in order to have this uh, to sort of have it all people will you you compromise by using basically two languages you'll have your you know the high level scripting language like Python or R and then and then a lot of things will also be written in C and then you use that to try to get the best of both worlds you know you can you know, write things in C for performance and then call them from the higher level language and so people sort of live in these in these two worlds and just accept that compromise. Um, and it's, you know, it, that works pretty well. It can, it can work well. Um, but, it's, uh, but if you think about it, it's, it's a little bit of a strange thing. It's like, is, is this permanently necessary? Do we have to have 
two languages or you know maybe three to do a certain kind of computing uh, and so you know it seems a little strange to me and so we you know we, we theorize that if you know when, what you're, what you're doing when you're uh, you know, moving into this other lower level language is you're sort of, you're sort of breaking an abstraction barrier. Um, a high level language provides, supposed to provide a, a higher level abstraction, uh, but when you need to, but you know, when it's, when it's no longer performing well enough or no longer meeting your needs, you have to sort of cast it aside and, and you know, do something totally different. And so, that, you know, this must mean that the abstraction is, is not the right one or is not, somehow not good enough. Uh, yep. So we, we're, we just want to try to do better. Yep. The real cost of these systems is actually not performance, because you can get performance, but it comes at a huge development cost. You have to dip, you have to break past this barrier and learn C, uh, learn how to program Python from C, learn how to program R from C. So the, the fact that you keep breaking through this abstraction barrier seems to be an indication that like, something's not, not quite right. Like maybe we, can, maybe we can come up with a better abstraction. So I'm uh, going to do an example here, a uh, little live coding. That should be fun, um, although we've already seen a fair bit today. So basically, we're going to do, we're going to create a new numeric type. Um, and we're going to do it the same way that numeric types are created in Julia itself. It's fully functional. It's you know, integrated with other types. And it's going to be fast and compact. Uh, and it's in 11 lines of code. So you want to take over the yeah, I'll, do, I'll take over. Okay, so, uh, oh, it's in here? Where am I? I'm not really. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do, uh, can I make this a little bigger? People can see. Yeah, there we go. No, that's fine. That's fine. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do, um, because we're going to be modifying a lot of built-in operations, is uh, import all base, which basically says I want to be able to modify all of the operations that are in base Julia, like addition and subtraction and multiplication. So I'm just going to get that out of the way at f up first. So the next thing we do is we define a type. Uh, so defining a type is, there's different kinds of types, but the most common types, which is a type with fields, kind of like a struct in C, um, or you know, an object in object, most object-oriented languages is introduced with type. We're going to call it modint um, for modular integer, and it's going to have a type parameter. So this is another usage of the, the curly braces here, which is that we, uh, we you can parameterize types by other types and also by values. Uh, actually, only certain types types of values, but integers you can you can use as type parameters. And so what this is going to be is the the modint type is going to have the modulus as a type parameter. You don't have to do it that way, but it sort of makes sense mathematically because you know all the integers mod you know whatever seventeen are a field. They're a, they are their own type, and it doesn't make sense to mix and match them, but they sort of live in their own little universe. Um, modint is going to be a type of integer. Uh, declaring that sort of lets it inherit some predefined generic functionality. We're going to give it a field, call it k, and it's going to be just a regular Julia integer. Um, we're going to give it a constructor. So constructors go in here, and what you do is you say, uh, you know, given some k, I'm going to create a new one of these guys by reducing k mod n, uh, and then the new thing is it's a it looks like a function, but it's actually a little bit different. It constructs a new object for you. Um, okay, so this is pretty straightforward. That's the whole definition of the type. So what you can see here is that mod int is now a type. It's a thing. It's a t composite kind. Uh, you can create specific instances of it. It's actually a whole family of types, right? So there's modint 11, there's modint 17, there's modint 2, and each of these is a different type. So this is, because it's a parametric type, you have this whole family of types that you can, you've actually declared. 
So let's create a value of this type. Okay, so we've got a value A, value B. It prints, there's a default printer for, for that's uh, created for you, but you know, it's not terribly pretty. So let's define a new way to print things. Now this is a little, you don't have to understand all of this, but basically it, uh, this just tells the system how to print these guys more, more nicely. So what we're going to do is we're going to say I want to print it as you know the the number mod n. So now we should be able to print a a little more nicely. So there we've already modified the the way you know the d default way of doing these things. So b can be a new mod n. Okay. So now we've got two different mod int guys. So a natural thing we might want to do now is try to add them. But we can't do that because this is a brand new type. It has, we've told it, we've given it a representation, but we've given it no behavior. It doesn't really know how to do anything. So we need to teach it how to do something. So will you do that by adding methods to the plus function? So Julia has what's known as multiple dispatch, which is that basically is a system where you have something like the plus function, but it actually has lots of little methods that apply to various different types of combinations. And if you've ever used Mathematica, the way Mathematica lets you define various combinations of things or, you know, and then, you know, a left-hand side, right-hand side rule is very similar. So let's define Okay, so what this says is this is a, a this is a method signature that's gonna gonna apply to mod int n two two element two mod int n's uh, the little curly braces there around the end at the beginning is basically saying this is for all n this method applies um, it's gonna require that n, the n's be the same we'll I'll see, show you that in a second so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna create a new mod int n object that just adds the k fields of the two of the two of a and b so now you can see that that just works so yeah that's, and that's correct right yes 10 plus 2 mod 11 is 1 um, so what won't work here is if we define c as equal to mod int 13 of uh, you know, 45, if we try to add a plus c, it doesn't work. Um, so what it's saying there is it's trying to figure out a way to add these two things. And you know, the, that plus method only works when the two ends are the same. That's kind of what the, the, the dispatch rule is saying. Okay, so that, that so, gives us a little bit of stuff. Um, we can already do a fair amount of stuff. So if I can just say one yeah, thing. Yeah, so if you, if you remember on, on, uh, on Alan's slide earlier where he had the example of complex 3 and 4.0 where you're making a, a complex number out of an integer and a float, uh, it, it actually returned a complex float. And so that's sort of a little behavior that someone has specified somewhere that you know, combining an integer and a float should give you a, a complex float. And that, that's the kind of thing that's usually built in in a language. Like that's just part of the C standard, for example. Uh, but in, in Julia, it's entirely defined in, in user code in libraries. And so this, and we're seeing sort of a piece of that here, uh, is that there's basically, the, the, there's a numeric type promotion mechanism that's, that's totally programmable. And so that's, it was inside a, a function for doing uh, promotion and it, could, it couldn't find a, a way to, uh, to combine these into a common type. And so when you, if you define types, you can define uh, promotion rules to, uh, to integrate them with, you know, with the rest of, of the system. Mm -hmm. And so that's, it's entirely programmable. In fact, let's, uh, let's do that. So right now, um, we can do a plus b because those are both mod ints, but let's say we wanted to do a plus 1. That doesn't work because 1 isn't a mod int, it's an int 64. But what we can do, we could, for example, add a method that does this. a mod int n b 
int, and then you just create a new mod int, and you look at the k field of, of that, and then you just add b to it, and that creates a new mod int. So now we can do a plus 1. OK, that works. But you know, here's the trouble. Now, you know, let's say we do want to do 1 plus a. Yeah, OK, that doesn't work. So now that's annoying. Um, you know, you'd also want to do other things like a minus 1, a, you know, various other things that you, you might want to do, and you can't do them. So is there a way we can get around this? The, the promotion system we have does actually let you do, define two very simple things and suddenly get a huge amount of functionality. And so what you need to do is you need to provide a way to convert between different types and then a promotion rule. So the convert is pretty straightforward. There's a little bit of weird, you know, type dispatch syntax here, which you'll have to forgive me for, but um, okay. So the way you convert, this is basically just saying the way you convert an integer x, which is an integer, to the type mod int n is to just apply this mod, mod int n to it. OK, so now we can test that this works by saying yeah, OK, so that works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, what kind of warning? Mm -hmm. uh, so the question is about uh, so like, like warnings if you're like losing information in a conversion right. or something. So yeah, it's, I mean it's it's certainly like, possible to uh, if you're defining your own, you can you know you could print warnings like that. Uh, in our in our built-in uh, well in our in our library uh, conversions uh, for things like float to int, we will actually uh, if in in some cases if the, if the value can't be reproduced faithfully, we will right. throw an error. Uh, in a few cases. Ah, yeah. So we so for for integer overflow, we d we don't do anything fancy for performance, but actually we're we're sort of in the middle of uh, adding functionality that will let you turn that on uh, if you want. So one of the uh, nice things about the way this is is done is that it's very simple to modify the way the system works. Um, if you wanted to go in and just you know little at, at put checks in all your integer arithmetic, it would slow things down, but that's you could do it. Uh, a question. When you define a plus function, it looks like the regular function, but what lets you use it in infix? Ah, he's, the question is about the, the infix uh, syntax. So the infix syntax of some operators, uh, which are just special function names, uh, that's that is built in. So you, right now you can't add new infix operators. Well, you can, but it's but hard. Basically, you have to well. ask him to do it, and then he does it. <laughs> <and> <laughs> It's not, it's not overly difficult, but it's not part of the user-facing language yeah. to, to add new infix yeah. operators. The, the plus object is you, is you can use it as a function. You can kind of look at it and see what all its methods are, just like you would with any other function. Um, I guess that's the ultimate multiple dispatch right there. Yes, there, there, plus there is even, highly, highly polymorphic. Um, OK, so we def designed, defined, did conversion and defined that. So now. The next thing we wanted to find to be able to integrate better with other systems is this thing as a promotion rule. Uh, and basically, what a promotion rule is, it says if we have two types, which one wins? And so in this case, we're going to say if we have a mod int type and we have an int type, we're going to say that that becomes a mod int and we could go the other way and say that if you have a mod in n and you add it to an integer, you get an integer. But what we want is we want actually want to be able to say a plus 1 and get a, a mod in n number. So now uh, what that does is it actually allows this promote function to take a pair of numbers and promote them to a common type. Now, why does that not work? Uh, I'm not sure. That's weird. Hmm. Uh, that's weird. Hmm. Uh, is okay. There, is there anything 
like strange in the environment? Is I have no idea. This is not my machine. No, that should be right. Uh, I don't know. Well, anyway, let's see if uh, 1 plus A works now. Huh. Did this machine get screwed up somehow? Let's hmm? Oh yeah, that'll it'll all work. Yeah. Okay, now it works. Something got messed up in that terminal. Hmm. Um, okay, so what this did is it promoted A and 1 to a common type. And so you get, you know, 10 mod 11 and 1 mod 11. Um, what happens is that there are, there are backup rules for things like plus and multiply and, you know, whatever that basically take things, promote them to a common type, and then do the operation. So this will immediately allow you to do things like a plus 1, also 1 plus a. Um, we haven't really defined many other operations, so that doesn't really help. But let's say we define, uh, where did we? Anyway, let's, uh, let's define the, the plus, the star operator instead. It's pretty straightforward. It's a very similar definition. Okay, so I mean this definition just stems tr straight from the way modular arithmetic works. Now we can do a times b. Uh, b equals okay. So a is ten. A times b. There we get the correct answer. Um, but because of the promotion rule, we now don't have to do anything particular to plus. We can already do 2a and 7a because now we know how to combine these, these num the int regular integers and, and various other things. So it doesn't seem like that much that we've done so far, but we actually already have a fair amount of functionality. We can do various things like, for example, let's create an array of a matrix of these numbers. OK, wow. So now we have a matrix of mod int n numbers. Um, yeah, so we can already do things like a plus a. We can do 2a. We can do a times a, a squared. Um, let's define another another matrix B, A plus B. Um, we can do things like two two A cubed plus A times you know minus A times B plus five. Uh, oh, I didn't I didn't define minus yet. Uh, let's just define minus. That's easy enough. There we go. That's minus. Is that minus? Uh, no, I think it might be just a method caching. Um, just put it in brackets, maybe. Uh, no, it's me it's method caching. Uh, and of course, B doesn't even have. B could have just been Venn die itself in the original. Also, would work. It didn't, he didn't have to be a, a Right. Uh, yeah, see, now this works. Um, we're we're going to work on invalidating things when we you do new different definitions, but it's a little bit awkward sometimes. Okay, so you see you can do. Type A plus I. Oh, yeah, A plus. 
B times M. Oh uh, yeah, we don't we don't have a way of making complex pairs of modulus of I. Yeah. I. So you don't need to be I You mean E Y E. Oh I. Okay, <laughs> gotcha. Uh what size is A? Ten? It's it's float though. Ten Yeah. It's a float, yeah. So there we go. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you can already, you, you, you need to flush it out with a few more things in order to get, uh, you know, a few, few more conversions here backwards and forwards, but you really only need like a handful of more lines in order to have like a really fully functional mod int type. Um, you want to talk a little? Can or? you just, uh, can you just uh, type plus again and just, just show the, uh, the, the methods? Yeah, of course. So. I just want to I just want to point out that so so you, you can look at uh, you can look at all the definitions that exist for you know any of our uh, library functions like this uh, and this you know this is pretty fun to look at because this this these huge lists of uh, definitions this is really our, our secret sauce this is sort of the the the, the core of our, our whole design is that you can incrementally specify lots of behaviors for highly generic functions with with fairly detailed information about you know when they apply in different circumstances like in the you know, in, in the mod int case, for instance, you have a, you have something fairly subtle, like a, a plus method that applies to mod ints with the same modulus. You know, so you can you can express things like that, uh, and these and these rules are always consistently applied. Is that it? Always, uh, we'll just always apply the most specific, applicable method, uh, in every circumstance. Um, and so this is, I mean, this sort of stems from you know our. If you think about uh, like all, all the versions of plus and times that exist in the world, you know how many things plus could mean, you know, in MATLAB. You know, that they're just there. There are many, many definitions, right? There, there are many things it can be applied to, and so this is that's sort of to us is sort of the core of the of the uh, you know the behaviors of these kinds of things, uh, and so to be able to you know specify these behaviors in this in this very rich way is both it's 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 fairly easy. Uh, it's reasonably easy to program because you can just sort of throw in one little definition at a time. Uh, and incrementally build up uh, behaviors, and it's, it's and it's um, and it also provides a, a large amount of, of information and sort of metadata uh, to the system uh, that the compiler can use very effectively. Uh, and you know, you, it has a documentation role too. You know, you can tell me, you can search for methods that apply to different types and things like that. So it just just provides a very nice amount of uh, information in in the system, which is sort of what the what the whole thing is based on. Is ten minutes right? To kind of yeah, that's about right. Okay. We're good. Um, you need the PDF viewer. Oh, the PDF viewer, that's right. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. Um, okay, so I mean, in, in all that stuff, the whole, the, the multiple dispatch is a mechanism in the language that the user can use allows you to take things that would usually be baked into the spec uh, and baked into the C code or whatever implements the low-level guts of a language um, and do it in, in user space very easily in Julia. Um, so that's, that's a, that gives us a lot of leeway where we don't have to break that abstraction barrier we were talking about earlier. Um, and the nice thing about this is you get, you get to define your own numeric types that are just as good as the built-in ones. Jeff, you want to talk about the? Uh, so, yeah. And so, uh, you know, one of one of our, our huge goals was to uh, for people to be able to define you know very very rich and interesting functionality just just in the high level language, and that that in fact has happened. Uh, people uh, came along and implemented some very you know pretty impressive features like like bit arrays, where the the storage for every element is just one bit inside a word. Uh, and somebody implemented that entirely in Julia, and now it's now it's in our library. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you do uh, like an element-wise comparison, for example, you'll get a, an array where, of booleans where every element is just one bit, uh, Wasn't that which is yes, yeah. that was. Car uh, Carlo implemented that after using Julia for about two weeks. <laughs> so I mean, it, it just it, it's kind of cool that he can do that, but it's also just something that you need to compare to like what it would take, for example, to hack that into NumPy or into R. It would be very difficult. And it would take someone of like an expert level. I mean, Carlo is a brilliant programmer, so it's not like you know, a, a you know a, a newbie programmer could easily do that. But you know, he was very new to the language. It didn't did, wasn't didn't require anything completely insane to do it. 
and there's uh, and there are other other you know impressive uh, projects that people have, have done. Like there's a great uh, package of statistical distributions. Uh, some of these guys here have, have been working on and uh, and are like a data frame type that we'll see more about uh, in a minute. Uh, and so you know, you know what what you get from that is sort of a, a a property that you want that's kind of, you can think of it as kind of like a, a skin ability, is that you know, if you want something that's sort of an R-like data frame, you can just you know, implement it, and then you have Julia plus you know, that type of stuff. And <laughs> instead, of, you know, instead of having a, you know, a separate language base. So that's, that's sort of the, the power and, and flexibility that, that we're after. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Is there a reason Uh, also, a question about defining new infix operators. Uh, it may it may yet still happen. Uh, I, yeah, it's not necessarily a final decision that you can't add new infix operators. I don't, I'm, I don't know. It's it's hard to specify precedents and do that in a sane way. It's well, sort it of could, it can be done. It can be done. It's easy. Like, like, like does it, right? Yeah. 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 yeah it, it can potentially be done. Um, uh, yeah, so the, the community is doing really well. Um, I mean, we, we have got 100 plus people who have contributed to just the core language, and I have, don't even know how many people have contributed to the whole ecosystem at this point. Um, you know, close to getting, we're sort of approaching 1,000 people on our mailing list. I don't know if we'll actually peak out before 1,000. But, um, and then uh, packages at this point, you know, CPAN is not exactly scared yet, but we're, you know, we've got 60 very useful, really high quality packages. Well, some are really high quality and some are probably barely runnable, but um, so, I mean, some of the ones that are really great are the data frames package, distributions package, uh, Gadfly produces beautiful graphics in SVG. Um, not this morning. <laughs> uh, well, you're actually going to have talks on a couple. On a, yeah, we'll have talks on a couple of these things. So, and then there's one. I think we have one last slide, which is the obligatory performance slide. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you, we. Part of the reason, part of the the problem with the uh, numerical computing is that you need to make, take all of this abstraction. That's that's great, but if it was really dog slow, it would be no good. Um, and so part of the, the coup d'etat here, which is in, uh, almost entirely due to Jeff, because he's brilliant at build, build building compilers, is that this can all be done fast, too. So you take that very abstract way of defining how math should work in this language, um, and you, know, you can see this is a log scale graph, and Julia is within a factor of two of C uh, consistently across all of our micro benchmarks. Um, that doesn't mean that all code is going to be within a factor of two. Yes, I mean these these benchmarks are not you know are not really a it's not a thorough you know exhaustive uh, you know uh, exploration of all the kinds of programs and applications you might write by any means. It's just a, it's a very minimal benchmark that just shows sort of the you know what what the compiler is, is capable of in in good cases essentially. Yeah, it tests basic things like iteration, recursion, you know. But what? isn't it true that if somebody ran something and it wasn't quite as fast as they had hoped? They file an issue, and then the next day it is. Yeah, what tends to happen is someone has some code that's you know ten or you know God forbid twenty times slower than C, and then suddenly everyone you know he might do some compiler optimizations, and other people might be like, oh well, if you rewrite it like this, it allocates less memory, and it's actually you get it you know typically within a day or two you get it down to that nice factor of two. But yeah, we, we like to keep a, uh, you know, a, a test suite of you know, any cases people have encountered that didn't run as fast as they liked, and then we can, we'll try to optimize those. So if you, if you encounter something you know, that's slower than you'd like, just uh, you know, send it to us, and we'll see what we can do. Yeah. Also, the manual has, a, has one section on performance uh, at, yeah, the, performance the very end, at the very end. Yes, yeah, there are a couple, there are a couple of performance, the performance tips in, in the manual. It's near, near the end, yeah. 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 So. Cool. Yeah. Thank right, you. So we'll take like a one minute break.